Hi and welcome to a British audio file. For those of you who don't know me already, my name is Taryn. I just like to say that it's a lot of fun running a YouTube channel. A lot of work, don't get me wrong, but a lot of fun as well. I love the interaction that I have with you guys in the comments section. But one of the other things that I really enjoy is looking at products from brands that I wasn't aware of and perhaps you may not be aware of as well. And that's what I'm looking at today, the Atoll Electronic IN200 Signature Amplifier. It's when I saw a picture of what was under the hood that really caught my eye. This amplifier simply has an architecture that you don't see at this price. More on that later. But the IN200 Signature retails for £1,595 here in the UK. And that incorporates a fairly decent AKM DAC chip. In fact, for an extra £150, you can have the optional moving magnet phono stage if you desire as well. And you may think, well, that's understandable these days. Everything's cheaply built in China. But this isn't built in China. It's hand-built in the Normandy factory in France. And Atoll isn't a fly-by-night company as well. It's been going for the best part of 25 years. It was started by two brothers, Stefan and Emmanuel, with a surname that I'm not prepared to butcher here today. So let's take a closer look. The Atoll IN200 signature is 440 millimeters wide, which is about 17.3 inches, and weighs 12 kilograms, which is about 26 and a half pounds. It's an all metal case with a nice thick anodized aluminum front plate. The front control knobs are also aluminum. And the power switch is actually at the back, but you can take it out of standby by pressing this button here, which is also the input selection. And you're well served with a whole bunch of analog as well as digital inputs. Volume control goes up to 80 and has a nice feel. There's also a headphone jack at the front. Let me just show you the supplied remote control, which is obviously a generic Atoll device used to control their other products. The bottom third is dedicated to the amplifier. It has the basic functions, but what I like about it is that it has individual buttons for all the input selection, which you don't normally get, and that's a nice touch. It's a decent remote control. On the back you'll see the digital connections, there's a USB, two optical, two coax and a Bluetooth connection and then below that are the analog connections, there's actually two auxiliary inputs there, that little hole is for a 3.5mm auxiliary input and then the four line level inputs are labelled auxiliary, CD, tuner and DVD. There's a tape loop and then a bypass to use this as a power amplifier or to integrate in a home theatre receiver. There's two sets of pre-outs, so you can use that to connect to external power amps or powered subwoofers. There's the power switch and the IEC power inlet. And there's two decent quality speaker binding posts on either side. And right in the corner here, you'll see a 12 volt trigger input to use this in conjunction with other Atoll devices so you can effectively control them together. So when I take a look under the hood that things get quite interesting, well they do to me at least. The first thing that you're likely to notice are those two big whacking power transformers. If I can get around this side to show you the label, you might be able to make out the VA rating. It's 330 VA a piece in any case. Having one of those on an amplifier around this price would be quite impressive. Having two of them, well that's just ridiculous. And then there's the power supply filter caps. There's eight of them from top quality Japanese manufacturer Nishikon. Each one's rated at 6,800 microfarads. So what's that per side? Six and a half times four would be 26 plus 1,200. It's 27,200 per side, 54,400 in total. Again, beyond what you'd expect to see. Those output devices there, there's four of them mounted onto those black heat sinks and they're MOSFETs. Again, every other amplifier I've seen around this price just has two. That's what you'd expect to see in a classic class AB design in push-pull configuration where you've got one transistor taking care of the positive part of the signal before handing over to the other transistor to take care of the negative part. Just to give you some kind of context, my Hegel H160 has four output devices per side, but that's a more expensive amplifier, and it doesn't have the same amount of power supply filter capacitance, nor does it have two big whacking power transformers. What we have here 
is a dual mono design, essentially two mono blocks in one chassis. And if we examine the power amplifier itself, what you'll see is a fully discrete design with lots of through hole components rather than those tiny surface mount components. And that's in the pursuit of better sound quality. Those tiny little cylindrical objects that you see, those are electrolytic caps. Again, from good quality manufacturer Jamicon. And it's the same on the other side in this dual mono design. The preamplifier sections underneath that board there and there's the input switching relays which you can't quite make out and that board on top is the DAC board with the Bluetooth antenna and receiver and uh, that is spaced around the AKM DAC chip. I can't make out the actual DAC chip. My eyes aren't good enough these days. That XMOS chip is to take care of the USB interface. All in all, this kind of architecture you don't see at this price. The fact that it's hand built in Normandy in their factory is highly impressive. It's something that you'd expect to spend two, maybe three times as much to try and get this kind of quality under the hood. I'm going to let the cat out of the bag here straight away and tell you that this is a very fine sounding amplifier and one of its key strengths is bass speed and bass control. It gets hold of a rhythm and simply doesn't let go. The bass notes start and stop on a dime and it's way beyond anything that I've experienced from competitive products whether it's the Hegel H95, the Exposure 2510. The only thing I think that came relatively close was the NAD M10. And this has to be attributed to the IN200 Signature's massive power supply. Base speed and control, yes, but not the last word in base weight. Let me just explain. Any boxing fans out there, do you remember the Anthony Joshua versus Andy Ruiz fight? Not the first one, but the second one, where Joshua decided to dance around the ring rather than plant his feet in the center and deliver a knockout punch. He was a little bit gun shy that night. And that's the feeling you get with the IN200 signature. You get the feeling it's capable of delivering a real knockout bass performance, but it decides to be a little bit lighter on its feet. It certainly has less bass weight than those competitor amplifiers I just spoke about. The clarity of bass translates to a lack of obscurity in details in the mid-range. I don't think the Atoll is much more revealing in terms of fine details than say the Hegel H95. It certainly doesn't reveal more timbral information, but it's a different presentation that draws your attention much more to the detail. The Hegel H95 in comparison is what I'd consider more neutral. It's more organic and certainly has more harmonic richness. In comparison, the IN200 signature is a little bit leaner in the lower mid range and there's a little bit of an uplift in the higher mid range in the presence region, somewhere around two to 5,000 Hertz which gives it a slightly more forward presentation, a slightly more drier and analytical sound. The high frequencies are well extended. There's a real airiness on top. I'd never describe it as bright or harsh, but there's certainly a little bit more sparkle on top than the Hegel H95. And that plays into the Atoll's more detail oriented presentation, which some people will really like. But when it comes to ultimate refinement and sibilance control, I think the Hegel is a touch better in that regard. There is a difference between these two amplifiers in the way that they project sound. I find that most amplifiers around this price have very limited soundstage depth, and that's the case with both of these amplifiers. But there is a difference in soundstage width. The Hegel H95 has a slightly wider soundstage. The sound is projected in the plane of the speakers and reaches slightly behind. With the Atoll IN200 signature, soundstage is a touch narrower it's again presented in the plane of the speakers, but projects slightly forward. And that's probably down to the fact that there's a slight uplift in the upper mid-range presence region. It's just a question of the way that this amplifier has been voiced. When it comes to imaging, well, the imaging on the IN200 signature is laser etched, and it's slightly more vague on the Hegel. I should also talk about the quality of the internal AKM DAC, which is very good inside this amplifier. It's not just bolted on for convenience. I did switch it out by connecting my Chord Mojo DAC to the analog inputs of the amplifier. 
Cord Mojo gave a bigger, warmer, richer presentation. That's what you expect from the Mojo. That's what its presentation is all about. But in terms of overall clarity, the internal AKM DAC was better. That's how good the internal DAC is inside this amplifier. Then I hooked up the Denifrips Pontus II that's here for review at the moment. Now I don't think that people are likely to be hooking up a 1900 pound DAC to an amplifier that retails for less than 1600 pounds. I just wanted to see what this amplifier was capable of. The Pontus II combined the best traits of the Chord Mojo with the internal AKM DAC to elevate the performance to another level. But I think the vast majority of people are gonna be more than happy with the quality of the internal DAC. Well, this section is gonna be pretty straightforward. This is a real beast of an amplifier. It's not so much the very generous 120 watts on tap into eight ohms, going up to 200 watts into four ohms, although that's much more than you'd ordinarily expect around this price. It's the fact that it's backed up by such a beefy power supply and plenty of output devices that can deliver real current. It's gonna drive all bar the most demanding speakers in whatever room you're likely to put them in. I tried it with a whole bunch of different speakers. The Fine Audio F700s that I recently reviewed on this channel have a slightly warm tonal balance and they combine really well with the slightly more analytical sounding Atoll. As did the Sound Artist LS35A replicas that also have a slightly warm tonal balance. You don't need that much power to get those speakers to sing, but it's nice to have it if you've got it. I thought the Amphion Argon Ones, which have a slightly cooler tonal balance, might be a bit of a mismatch, but the reality is that the IN200 signature doesn't have that much sonic coloration, so even that combination worked well, even if it wasn't on the warm side of neutral. My product response 1 SEs have caused many an amplifier around this price to stumble. Don't get me wrong, most have driven them okay, but in order to get the best out of the Proax, you need an amplifier with real grip and control and plenty of finesse, and that really comes cheap. The IN200 signature drove them perfectly. If I had a criticism, it would be this. The ultra-revealing nature of the Proax in the mid-range did reveal a bit of hardness in the Atoll in that frequency range but this isn't something that's likely to get picked up by many speakers. The last thing that I wanna mention here is that this is an amplifier that'll play very loud. That should be fairly obvious, but it's also very good at low listening levels, and that isn't always the case with bigger amplifiers. And the reason is because dynamically, it's very good across the board. I know I mentioned that it's not the last word in terms of bass weight and extension, but I'm talking about the general dynamics, whether you're listening at low levels, moderate levels, or cranking it up. So who is the Atoll IN200 signature for and who isn't it for? Well, for those of you who want the last word in tonal neutrality around this price, you're better off going for the Hegel H95. And if you can go without the DAC and some of the other features, well, the Exposure 2510 is still the best amplifier I've heard, sonically speaking, around this price. But there may be those of you who want a more powerful amplifier for a particular reason. It may be that you're listening in a larger room, you have really demanding speakers, or you just like to crank it up. And for all of you, I'd put the Atoll IN200 right at the top of your list to audition. It also may be for those people who have speakers that are on the warm side and neutral, and they wanna just pull them back into a more neutral balance, or they've got speakers that have got slightly loose and bloated bass performance, and they want that kept under check and under control. And again, the Atoll will work superbly well, I think, in those kind of applications. The internal DAC is excellent, and for vinyl enthusiasts, you may well want to check out the 150 pound option for the moving magnet phono stage. If it's as half as good as the DAC, I think that may be well worth considering. For all of these reasons, the Atoll IN200 signature gets a highly recommended from this channel. Well, that's it for me for today. All that remains for me to say is if you like this video, please hit that like button, please share it. And if you like what I'm doing with this channel and you haven't subscribed already, please consider subscribing. And don't forget to check me out on Patreon where you can support me financially and check out some of the services I offer in terms of consultancy and patron only videos. But for today, for now, a British audiophile, signing off.